family church fallacies. And so we're going to talk about something that might be a little bit controversial. Uh, we're going to talk about home groups, small groups, organic church, kind of that, uh, you know, in focus. And man, I'm telling you what, we need a revelation of the purpose of the church. So my name is John Burton and I'm with Revival X here in Branson, Missouri. Of course, this is my studio and we're starting live local events uh, Tuesday. And so I'm excited about that. You know, if you are not RSVP'd and you live locally, make sure you go to revivalx.tv slash RSVP. And uh, we would love to see you Tuesday here in Branson West. But I'm going to try to uh, bring some teachings to you once a week. We're, we're taking a slow roll into the development of, a, of an online revival community, an online church community. Um, possible that I might do these teachings live, maybe, uh, sometimes, other times recorded, and but maybe on Sunday mornings, maybe. Let me know what you think. By the way, I love hearing from you. I want to, uh, you know, hear your heart and what's your name and where are you from and what are you looking for and you know we've been involved in ministry for decades and uh, uh, 30 years or so something like that um, and so we're excited about this new chapter in this new season and God's going to be doing some cool stuff so go to revivalx.tv you can learn all about you know the ministry you know what's going on where we've been uh, you know kind of our history our bio all of that kind of stuff and but more most importantly you know the vision where are we going we are all about revival we want an outpouring of the holy spirit we want the fire of god to fall um and you know he's waiting for a remnant people a hungry people that are just gonna go after it and so that's what this is all about uh you know we're gonna do these lives we're gonna do these teachings i'm, I'm on tiktok and uh, youtube and youtube shorts and so um, most days I'm trying to upload, you know, quick 60 second punchy, fiery videos. So you can go there, go to, uh, revivalx.tv slash social and get all that information there. So there's a lot going on podcasts, doing those for all of you audio oriented folks. And, um, but I'm excited today. We're going to get into this and I'm going to talk about, you know, what I'm calling family church fallacies. And there's a passage of scripture that people love to use and honestly i've never i've never felt fully comfortable with the way people use this scripture and i also i've also not heard a lot of teaching on it uh, i'm sure it's out there but i think this is something that we really need to focus on let me um let me start by saying this uh no uh everyone should not have a lesson or a hymn or a revelation or a tongue or interpretation okay so again i said this might be a little controversial there's a lot of house churches out there that are being started or they're they're being run with this in mind and so there's all sorts of frustration out there in church world uh, because people don't want to just sit there and they don't, you know, and this is what they'll say. They don't want to just sit there and they don't just want to sit there for 45 minutes or an hour. And they don't want to just listen to teaching and they don't want to just sit in a pew and, you know, and, you know, and so I, I could cut another teaching. I'll come at it from the other side because yeah, we really do. Uh, we do have a problem out there with, with the way that the, the church is currently set up because I am huge, huge into seeing people uh, just released into their destinies and into their callings and to where, you know, uh, I love that. I mean, oh my goodness, do I love that. People where they're being discipled and equipped and trained and raised up uh, to fulfill that that calling on their life and to, you know, experience deliverance and freedom and uh, and to move out in great power. So, so we need more of that, we really do. We need uh, more of that in the church there's not enough of it out there. I understand. I get it. I get the, the frustration that people have with just sitting there and not being able to do some things. I, I get that. I think it's a, it can be a little bit misguided uh, because really the primary purpose, let me start with this before I dive into breaking down this, this 1 Corinthians 14 uh, you know, passage 
you know, about how everybody has a tongue and everybody has a him. Um, I'm going to break that down in just a second. But really, the primary purpose of the church is twofold. Number one, it's prayer. The, the Bible says that the church is a house of prayer for all nations. Primary purpose, which we don't see this, you know, and I've written on this for years and taught on this for years and challenged pastors on this for years. Uh, we don't see this. We don't see where intercession, prayer, uh, just that prophetic, fiery environment of prayer, of intercession, we don't, we don't see that as dominant or as primary in the church. In fact, most churches, it's non-existent, okay? Uh, that needs to be resolved. That needs to be fixed. So, so that's, that's one of the primary purposes of the church is prayer. You know, I believe that prayer should be front and center Sunday mornings or during the main service, really during most every service, where you are praying. I mean, praying, you know, and I'm not saying just, I'm not, I'm not saying worshiping. Yeah, worship is, is part of it, but I'm talking about praying. You know, when we would have our prayer movement, uh, secret prayer going on in Detroit and Colorado Springs years ago, you know, Pat, uh, we'd go into a different church every single Friday night from 12, uh, from 10 to midnight, and we would pray in tongues for two hours. And very, very often, it was very common where the pastor or whoever was in charge would ask, well, do you want me to have the worship team there? Do you want worship going on in the background? And I'd always say, no, we don't because it's too easy just to kind of default to that worship vibe, which we're all so familiar and comfortable in. We need to work the prayer muscles. We need to, we really need to do that. And so of course, worship plays a part and without question it does a huge part. Uh, but there's something to be said about prayer. So prayer uh, is the first primary, the first key purpose of the church. And the, and the second one, everybody, is apostolic teaching, okay? And so, so those of you that don't enjoy sitting there for 45 minutes uh, and listening uh, to teaching, that's a you problem. That's not a, that's not a pastor problem. That's not a church problem. Well, it could be a pastor problem if they're delivering a boring sermon that has no anointing. Again, that's another topic for another day. But it's a you problem because a primary purpose of the gathering of the ecclesia, the ecclesia it's a governmental gathering where, you know, back in the day, it's a secular term, ecclesia, they would gather the city leaders, the governmental officials would gather the people in the city, which by the way, here's another nugget for you. Church is defined by city, not by street corner. And, and so they would gather the people from the city and they would instruct them. They would give them uh, news, updates, information, uh, instruction. And so that's what, and that's, that's what we need in the church, apostolic instruction. That's different than just, you know, teaching, which teaching is critically important as well. It's, it's different than that though. It's apostolic instruction. You know, teaching is, uh, this is how you need, this is how you tie your shoes. Apostolic instruction is tie your shoes because it's time to run. And this is where we're going. And this is what we're doing all of us together as a, as a body, as a community. So that's the, that's the difference between teaching and apostolic instruction. We need more apostolic instruction. We need more teaching as well, but we need to have that distinction. So those are the two primary purposes of the church. There are other purposes. Um, not going to get too deep into all that, um, but, you know, yeah, it's the fellowship and is, is part of it. Um, but I'll say this. I will say this. I do not believe that the church is to be um, identified, I'm talking about the church gathering, the ecclesia. Or let me say it this way. The ultimate goal is not to, to somehow identify and come together as families. Like, okay, let's come together. We're family. And, you know, and we see in scripture, of course, that, that we are family, brothers and sisters and the household of God. And we get, I get all that. But the primary, the, the primary focus or the primary goal, you know, isn't to be, okay, we are family now. We're, fa we're coming together as family. That's not the goal. We are family. We are and, you know, sure, we need to be better brothers and sisters. And the Bible has all sorts of good info on that. You know, but uh, the goal is to advance the kingdom of God. So there's a mission. Okay, the mission isn't to kumbaya and to, and to hug and to, um, you know, have potlucks and to where that is the goal. There's a lot of churches out there that are doing it like that. 
That is not the goal. We are a family. We are a family. But we are coming together for purposes beyond simply identifying ourselves as a family. Okay? So the, the whole family church model, I don't believe is fully biblical. The church is a military. It's where we come together as family and we advance in the mission that God has given to us. Okay. And so, so this is just a little preliminary stuff. Let's so so the, the purpose of the church is, you know, and I think it was important for me to share this because a lot of people think that the purpose of the church is just, is primarily to come together and to be family and to, to where everybody has, you know, kind of equal footing and everybody has the same level of participation. Everybody has, you know, is, is, is able to do whatever they want. And it, 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 that's not church. And that's one of the, that's one of the key problems. I believe that we see today with the house church movement, you know, and a lot of that organic church is that it's this idea that we're all, um, functionally equal. We're not functionally equal according to scripture. The house church, the organic church, typically not always. There's some good house churches out there that understand all of this. There's, there really are. But, but often you're going to find that. And this scripture that we're going to look at here really speaks to it because this is kind of the house church mantra, if I can say it that way. Um, let me read it to you. This is first Corinthians 14, 26. It says that it says this, what then brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. Okay. So, so commonly all the time, I hear it all the time, everywhere. People are saying, wait a minute. The, the in, institutional church is what they'll call, you know, church as we know it, typical church. The institutional church is broken because they violate that scripture. Because when I go to the institutional church, everybody isn't allowed to have a hymn. Everyone does. Everyone can't have a lesson. Not everyone has a revelation, a tongue or interpretation. So that's not happening in the institutional church. So the institutional church is broken. They're out of alignment with the heart of God and they're out of alignment with, um, with, with scripture and we have a problem. Okay. I, I'm telling you right now that they are misunderstanding this verse radically, dramatically. And we're going to look at this. Okay. This, this is for many, it's the rallying cry. It's the rallying cry for the house church movement or, or for the, for the family church movement. It's, you know, they believe it's the perfect picture of the, of, of a Christian gathering. The perfect picture is wow. And understand, understand I've been in some small group meetings and house meetings that are awesome. Um, and you can have these types of meetings. You can, it's not that having a meeting like this is bad to where, it's, where let's say I invite people over to my house. It's like, all right, guys, we're just going to love Jesus together and open forum. And we're going to pray. Let's pray. And if you have a song, just, you know, let it rip, just worship. If, if God puts something on your heart, definitely release that. And we'll pray into that. And, uh, you know, if, if there's a tongue and interpretation, let that. And so I, I love that. But the, the distinction here is that is not the ecclesia. It is not the, the, the church. It is an expression of the church. It's, it, it's a part. It could be a part of the church. It happens when, you know, brothers and sisters in, in the family of God, right, gather together. So we can do that. But presuming that that is church, is the ecclesia, that's where we're getting messed up. And it's, it's it, not only is it not true, but even in those small gatherings, if we're not careful, we'll violate scripture. And again, we're going to look at this and let's do that right this very second. It doesn't really take much to uh, see the problem with this, okay? So again, we're talking about, you know, everybody's supposed to do all of these things if they want to. Everyone can have a lesson, can have, okay. Here's the deal. This verse is smack in the middle of a lengthy passage about restrictions 
and prohibitions in church services. Restrictions and prohibitions. So, so it's not the mantra of freedom or body ministry that many would presume that it is. Okay, now, now this, it's, it starts by saying, what then, brothers? That's, what, that's how the scripture starts. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. What then, brothers? It starts by saying that. You know, if you want to take a little bit of liberty, and we'll do that, modernize it. Another way we could say that is say what, brothers? Say what? Because you got to look at that. It says, what then, brothers? It means there's something going on before this verse. You, this verse does not stand alone. It can't stand alone. And man, we get into so much trouble. Uh, people get into so much tr trouble. You know, quoting scriptures... And, and they, 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 can, they were not designed to stand alone. Another one, and this is a related scripture that people use, it says, and it's hilarious if you really study it out because actually it disproves the point that they're trying to make by using this verse. And you know, Matthew 18, where, it talks, where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. So people use that all the time, all the time, and they use it wrongly. They use it all the time. And they're like, listen, all we need to do according to scripture is get just two or three, two or three of us gathered together and that is church. No, it's not, it's not church. And what's hilarious about that, again, that verse does not stand alone. What's hilarious about that is the context of that verse is all about hierarchy in the church and discipline in the church and what it's saying is when you when the leaders talking about you know and and we got to get this we're not all on this on the same level functionally now jesus loves us all and we can all access god the same way and all that. i'm talking about functionally some are teachers and some are not some are evangelists and some are not right and some are some are apostles some are not so, you know apostles outrank prophets prophet you know and so we need to understand all of this um and when done well it's it's healthy i get it i get it and i talk i've talked about this before when it's done in an unhealthy way it's ridiculous and you get all these power trips and but you can't you can't rewrite scripture because you're afraid of someone else's power trip you can't do that um but with that in matthew 18 what's what, what's happening there it's like discipline is happening and god's saying he's saying where two or three are gathered these two or three people are are those who are um um giving the discipline it's not just random people go, coming together to have a worship service or a Bible study. It's not talking about that. It's like, all right, you three, you, you two or three people here, you know, you are, you are appropriately, uh, you are the ones you are, and you are appropriately administering discipline. You're, you're the, you're the ones in terms, in terms of you have the authority to do this. You're appropriately administering discipline. And, and God's basically saying this is it, not easy and it's messy and it can, it's disruptive. And it's why a lot of churches don't, um, give discipline. They just let all sorts of stuff go on in the church because, because it causes problems and there's confrontation and all that. But God's saying where you're gathered together to do this, I've got your back is what he's saying. Okay. So that's an example of uh, a, a verse. And it's interesting because this verse is, is also used by many in the family church or house church movement or the organic church movement. And um, it's wrongly used. Well, let's jump back in here. First Corinthians 14, 26. And, but it starts by saying, what then brothers or say what brothers? Um, there, there's some shock that they are doing what's not appropriate. Okay. Boy, the, this, this will mess up your theology, especially those of you that have bought into this verse. And again, I need to qualify. I got to qualify this. I do not affirm power trips and I do affirm people uh, just why, just, 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 just wild Holy spirit environments where people are at, uh, uh, they're, uh, they're free and they're, they're, they're discipled and getting equipped and there's training and, and, and I believe in all that. Those of you that have been following my ministry, you know that I believe in all that. I love all that, but we, we can't get so sloppy with it that we are outside of the bounds of scripture. So, so again, what's going on here is you like, say, what are you really allowing everyone to have a tongue? So what's really, 
That's what, that's what this verse is saying. Really? Everyone is teaching? Um, that's not allowed according to scripture. You know, it's not allowed. The, 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 in fact, the appropriate flow of the gathering is, is addressed specifically. If you keep reading, let me, let's, let's read. It, it, this is hilarious. That, that we can't just take one scripture. We got to read the whole, the whole context, the whole passage in context. First Corinthians 14, 26 through 28. It says, it says this, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or th- uh, at most three and each in turn and let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. Okay, it's getting interesting here because it seems to be contradicting the way people have interpreted this when you come together, each one has a hymn verse, but it's saying it's, this is contradicting that because up here it says each one has a tongue. It's what, it's what it says, each one. So, so what people presume that means, and again, we're talking about the gift of tongues, not the, not, not the prayer of tongues. Okay. Praying in tongues is a vertical expression where we can all gather together and we can pray in tongues and we should do that. Uh, this is a horizontal to where there's a message. The message in tongues is what this is talking about. And, you know, so, so it's, it's in the verse that everyone loves. It's like everybody has a tongue. Every last soul. We got 20 people in this room right here. We're doing organic church, family church. All of you are important. All of you are valuable. And all of you can share a tongue. All of you. Is, is what people think that means. But then right after we've got the passage, as it continues, it says, if any speaks in a, speak in a tongue, there can only be two or three. It says two or at most three, usually two, sometimes three. Interesting. It seems like contradictory, doesn't it? Well, not if you understand this passage. Again, that passage is talking about prohibitions and restrictions and not not liber- not liberties and expectations and freedoms. It's, it's, we've got it, we, we got it wrong, all right? And again, if you all come to Revival X, you're gonna experience a full-blown Holy Spirit f- free atmosphere, but we're gonna do it according, to the best of our ability, we're gonna do it, do it according to scripture. Let's keep, let's keep going here. Um, it says, if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. So verse 26 reveals, that everyone had a tongue, but verse 27 reveals that only two or, two or three should have a tongue, and then only if there's someone to interpret, which that's that's crazy. So if, if someone has a tongue and no one interprets it, then, you know, you, 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 you dismiss that tongue. You know, the, the, the instruction is you stay silent and you do not give a message in tongues. You don't do it. Where we see in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, where it seems to say you do do it, and everybody does it, but suddenly after that, we see, nope, you don't. You keep silence, what it says, all right? Verse, uh, verse 26 highlights, everyone has a revelation. But verse 27 allows only two or three. You know, you get, get, open up you know, the, the scripture and, and, and grab it and read it. Verse 33 brings it all together. First Corinthians 14, 33 says this, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Okay. Um, but there's more, you know, there, there, there's more that we need to, to look at here. Um, and I just have my notes here. I don't have the full passage. I was, I was darting over here to kind of, I was looking for something over here. Um, but, but read about where it talks about, you know, Everyone has a revelation. Everyone has a tongue, you know, read about that, read about that in context. Um, and then verse 33, like I said, it brings it all together. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Additionally, additionally, the Bible makes it clear that not all are to teach. Everyone bringing a lesson as addressed in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 is inappropriate. It's not correct. It's not allowed. 
so interesting. It's inappropriate. James 3, 1, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So, so when, when, when uh, run biblically, house churches can be a healthy segment of the city church. However, it's easy to forsake some of the purposes of the church uh, gatherings. You know, the church, church isn't supposed to be perpetual family gatherings. You know, where we, we focus mainly on relationships. Sm you know, small groups can offer opportunities to connect uh, relationally, but that's, that's not the foundation nor the primary purpose of the greater city church. Um, you know, uh, uh, the ecclesia, it's not, a, it's not a local body. It's the greater church in the city. It's a gathering under apostolic leadership. It's a governmental uh, organization with a military level mission to accomplish simple uh, prayer, worship, and Holy Spirit, you know, Holy Spirit small group gatherings are great, uh, but nothing more than a small part of the greater picture. You know, we need to, we need to understand, you know, the purpose of the, of the fivefold ministry, you know, in the church. In the five and fivefold leader, it, leaders, fivefold leadership is key in the city church, and not everybody has been selected to lead in this fashion. It's just not the case. There's a, there, there are few who are called into the office of you know, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Um, you know, it's just a very few, in fact, and it, it's it, it's imperative that we understand uh, rank, order, government. Uh, you know, role, governmental roles, regional leadership, if we hope to see the kingdom advance. This is such a huge, huge point. And for, for the last, you know, 30 years of my life, I've been basically teaching this message one way or another. It's, it's ab about the city church, you know. Uh, my my, my uh, book, 20 Elements of Revival, hits on this, you know, directly, where, where it's all about the city church. We can't be islands unto, unto ourselves. Uh, you know, local churches, institutional churches in a city are really just a department of the city church. So, so there should be connectivity in the city. There should be that, that ecclesia in the city, those city gatherings. It's critical that that happens. Um, very rarely does it happen. Um, you know, we need that governmental leadership. A, a leadership movement is not biblical. I, you know, people get all excited you know, these organic church people and uh, they, they get excited about really how there's, you know, uh, there's no leadership. You know, someone might say, well, I'm a facilitator, but you know, there's really no leader. And we do this together as a, as a organic family. And that's, it's, it's okay if you wanna to come together and have a little powwow. That is not church. That's not ecclesia. It's just simply not, um, you know, those who promote house churches as the only expression of church necessary, uh, they fail to understand something else. God raises up leaders and will call the people to run uh, specifically with them. This is kind of a side point here. And, and so, what, so, so what happens when the group becomes too big to fit in a house? Most would say they split into two houses. So there's a problem with that. They lose their alliance with the fivefold leader God has called them to run with. They lose their pastor. They lose their apostle. They they lose that. I don't believe it's it's like it's like intentional church splits. You know, can there be a healthy way to to uh, to 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 do that? Yeah, I think there is. You know, and, and the opposite, and we in fact we see a lot in the uh, institutional church, unfortunately is that there is, they hold tightly, they hold the people tightly and they don't want to release them. You know, they don't want to release them into the city or release them into other movements or release them into other churches or things like that. Um, you know, they don't want to bless them as they go and that kind of stuff. We see that quite a bit uh, in the institutional church. Um, you know, for me in all the years I've been in ministry and leading churches, I've always had an open hands policy. My policy is, you know, um, nobody can steal my sheep because I don't own them. I just don't own them. And so I've always had this policy that when I was leading churches at, you know, at any time, any pastor, any leader, anybody is f absolutely free to recruit anybody that they want for my church. They can recruit my worship leader. They can recruit my, my children's director. They can recruit my associate pastor. They can recruit my best intercessors. They, they can recruit uh, the most mature saints in the house. They can anybody without, with, with no fear. They don't have to come to me first. They don't, they, they don't have to do anything. 
They can freely recruit. Why? Because I trust that God is in control. He's going to go ahead and he's going to uh, lead the people where they need to go. Now, I believe I believe it's also appropriate for people before they leave that they come to me if I'm the leader and, and I can give me an opportunity to bless them. Or there might be times when I'm when I might share. I don't feel comfortable about this. I don't know that the Lord is on this. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just sharing with you, you know, kind of my 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 insights here. So all of that, there's all of that process that's appropriate. Okay. I'm not going to go too deep into all this, but I want to cover some of the questions I'm sure you'll have. Uh, but, I, but I've, I've always done that. Um, and boy, it just eliminates all the stress of, 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 you know, what happens if someone else is scouting out my folks and I got to keep them close. And um, I, I don't do that. Right. And so I, I think so that, so, so church doesn't go too strong the other way of just keeping them you know, uh, too, keeping it uh, too tight of a hold on them. Um, but, but on the flip side, the, with the whole house church thing, they say, well, we'll just split. We'll just, mul- they, you know, multiply. And it just, it can work sometimes, but you know, if God, you know, it does something in my life through an individual who's, who has a great anointing on their life, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I've, I've, God's called me to run with them. God's called me to, to, to be equipped by them, to glean things from them. Uh, it's important for me to, to be with them. And then, I, then I'm there. And then all of a sudden the group gets too big. And I'm like, okay, John, you got to leave now. You and these 10 other people are going to go uh, over to this other you know, house. And you know, this guy here is going to give leadership. I'm like, I don't even think I like that guy. And I don't sense as strong an anointing on him or whatever. And it's just a mess. It's a mess. Again, we're, we're getting a little, these are little kind of, kind of tangent side note things, you know, about the house church movement. Um, but, but it, it's very much connected because we need to understand biblical leadership and God will raise up leaders. You know, we can't have a leaderless movement. God raises up leaders and uh, he raises up men and women of God that others are called to run with. We see it all throughout scripture. It's all over the place, right? You know, follow me as I follow Christ. And you know, there, I, there have been churches that I've attended and play. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. I, I, you know, this isn't that hard to understand. Is it, you know, why do you listen to their, you know, this person's teaching, you know, so much, well, man, they've just rocked my life. And I want, I feel like I'm called to, to, to glean from them. And so we don't want to just split churches when they get too big. So now what do you do as a house church? Well, you get a, you're going to have to get a building. Oh, uh oh, <laughs> you're, you're an institutional church now. Um, you know, the, the idea that, you know, that we have to leave that body and start again elsewhere with someone who may or may not carry the same weighty anointing. It just doesn't make sense. In fact, I've been in, in some house church meetings um, and small groups <laughs> where I wanted to run away screaming. You know, can we keep it a little bit real? You know, some people just don't have the gift of leadership. Their teaching is weak and boring. And, and the same is true in this institutional churches. Um, it's, it's critical that we have seasoned people giving leadership to the church. You know, and this, it's, it's fully biblical. It absolutely is biblical. You know, we can't just, you know, let's split and, and this guy here is going to give some leadership. It just doesn't work that way. You know, the concept of organic ministry, it sounds appealing. Uh, but I can't see how it's supported in scripture. God calls a person, gives them a mission, reveals a vision, anoints them and mandates they gather people to get equipped and to labor for the cause. The, you know, the church, is a, it's a military, not a family reunion. Uh, so yeah, when done right, house churches have a role. Organic churches have a role. Um, but they're simply a small department of the greater church and never meant to be an entity unto themselves. So I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I know a bit, a little bit, a little bit controversial, maybe uh, something that you haven't heard before. But read that passage in Scripture, you know, where you know it says, you know, everyone should have a lesson. But no, <laughs> later, pretty quick after that, nope, everyone's not supposed to teach. Well, everybody has a revelation. No, you know, only you know, only you know this. You know, how many people can prophesy? Everybody can't prophesy. Two or three. You know, everyone. You know, everyone should have a tongue. No. Nope. Only two or three are supposed to have, an, have a tongue, and only if there's an interpretation. Uh, the Bible says that not all are supposed to teach, you know. So on and on. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, we're going to keep bringing these messages to you. If you do want to give to the ministry, 
just a uh, uh, opportunity. You can do that. Go to Revival x.tv slash give and you can do that right there um but and, uh, and definitely check out everything else that's going on there follow me on tiktok you'll have some fun with uh with with all of that that i'm uploading most days and uh if you're here in branson i want to see you tuesday night this tuesday you know i know most of you are going to be watching this video well after the event but what is today? Today is the 29th of January, 2023. So on the 31st of January, 7 p.m. at the Ledgestone Country Club. Uh, and we're praying, our last one was canceled because of snow. I'm praying that the snow doesn't come. There's a slight chance of some weather and I'm hoping, please Jesus, because let, let, the clubhouse will close, you know, uh, under certain circumstances. So. Uh, and we can't use it. So, um, but that's Tuesday, but you have to RSVP or you don't have to. We really like for you to RSVP. So we have an idea who's coming, uh, how many are coming because the room's only so big. Um, so, uh, so go to revivalx.tv slash RSVP. Okay, everybody, you are amazing. I pray God just blows your mind with his goodness, with his love, with his life joy, peace, all of that. I pray that uh, miracles would happen in your life. I pray that the fire of the Holy Spirit would just burn hot. Uh, I pray that you'd have dreams and visions. I pray in the night seasons that you just just encounter God. Uh, pray in tongues. I pray God would just open that up in your life in a fresh new way. And, and, and I pray in Jesus' name that you, as, as you are, as you run with us here at Revival X and all of the other places, God's calling you to, 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 to focus on and to grow from. I pray that you grow and you grow and you grow and you grow deep and you grow strong. I pray that humility drives you and, the, and, and, and love dominates in Jesus name. I pray that um, just a critical spirit and anything like that, if it ever tend, you know wants to creep up, that you would crush that demon and you would just, you would be someone who's full of uh, life, abundant life in Jesus name. Amen. All right. See you next time. Not sure when we're going to do this. Maybe every Sunday morning. It could happen. Sometimes live, sometimes recorded. But I want your feedback. Leave me your feedback. If you can't figure out where to comment, uh, just go to revivalx.tv slash contact. I, I, I would love to hear from you. All right. You're amazing. Blessings. Talk to you next time.